Hello, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for making the time today to attend Professor Stephen Billet's webinar, Engaging Time, Jealous Students. So to begin with, I'd like to start with the acknowledgement of country. So Samir will just play a video. Bagel, Nayang, Jimbalungs. G'day, friends. My name is John Graham. I'm a proud Kumba Mary man, a saltwater man of the Gold Coast region. Our people are part of the wider Yugambeh language group. The Kumba Mary lands stretch from the Goomera Goomera, the Coomera River to the north, down to the Tweed River in the south, bordered by the beautiful Pacific Ocean and the foothills of the Great Dividing Range. I'd like to acknowledge my elders past, present and emerging, for as I say, it all welcomes. It is important to recognise the hard work that our old people did in dark times. And we continue that legacy into today so that we can also pass on that reconciles state onto our young people because they're the bearers of the flame, the keepers of the knowledge and keep our culture strong into the future. I'd also like to pay my respects to the spirit of this land and her people, which includes all of you here today. My authority to speak today comes from Waru, my apical ancestor, whose connection through her daughter, Jenny Graham, passed on through Frank, Jack and Leonard Graham, my father allows me to speak with authority uh, on Kumamari land uh, and so that we uh, acknowledge this place. Please respect this place as you go about your business and walk within our lands because that respect is reciprocal. We need you to maintain that reciprocity while you are within Kumamari lands and other places on other campuses that people may be studying on. Welcome to this country. It's a special place. Please respect each other, respect the country and her people and the fauna and flora. It's important that you do this, that we maintain this into the future. Anyabu, anyabu, until we meet again. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to quickly introduce myself. So my name is Louise and I'd like to introduce Samia and we're both on the service learning unit. So we're here to assist and help with the webinar. So now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Stephen Billet. I'll just give you a brief overview. Dr. Stephen Billet is a professor of adult and vocational education in the School of Education and Professional Studies at Griffith University, Brisbane, Australia, and a national teaching fellow and Australian research Council for Future Fellow. After a career in garment manufacturing, he's worked as a vocational educator, an educational administrator, teacher educator, professional development practitioner, and a policy developer in the Australian vocation education system, and as a teacher and research at Griffith University. So now I'd like to hand it over to Professor Stephen Billet. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Louise, and thanks everybody for um, attending this third of the three webinars based around the, the OLT funded project on augmenting students learning for employability through post practicum educational processes. Um, there is this, of the series of three webinars, the first one, those of you who participate in it in the 10th of November, focused on the purposes of post practicum interventions and their enactment. And that, the question there was for what purposes and through what approaches would post-practicum interventions be effective for your field of teaching? So this was looking then at the, the reasons why we would do this and there's considerations from an educational perspective, but we also uh, encountered issues that students had particular purposes of participating in these events. And then in the webinar two, last week's webinar, we looked at models and processes of post-practicum interventions. And there we drew upon the projects um, that were in the OLT funded uh, grant, which looked at the different ways in which the projects there had approached this task of augmenting students' workplace experiences once they'd had them. And there was what are the qualities of models of post-practicum interventions and their enactment that would be pertinent for an effective in your field of teaching. Now, throughout, one thing that's been very clear is the importance of student engagement. And 
in particular, what were, what were encountered prior to this project was that contemporary um, students are, can be described as being time jealous. And so this webinar focuses on issues of student engagement and how contemporary time jealous students can come to integrate, so, sorry, come to engage in work integrated education and work integrated learning. And so the, the question we're addressing here is how can contemporary time jealous students be assisted to engage effortfully in post practicum activities to achieve effective outcomes? Okay, so, um, so across many of the projects and, and earlier as I'll foreshadow, this issue of student engagement is central to, is central to the success of educational programs and educational engagement. And um, it seems that um, uh, contemporary uh, students are not time poor <clears throat> as they're often described, but instead that they're time jealous or, or potentially time precious. And that is they need to use their time effectively because of overlapping and competing commitments. Um, and as with learning, um, how students come to engage and integrate and reconcile the experiences they've had in both workplaces and the educational programs they participate in is gonna be central to the quality and extent of the outcomes of those experiences. That is, unless students engage effortfully, the outcomes are likely to be far less uh, robust, far less strong, far less powerful or potent than if students are engaging in these processes intentionally and effortfully. So, as I've said, superficial or reluctant participation can lead to weak educational outcomes. Consequently, it seems important to identify how best students can come to engage in these kind of experiences, particularly because you know, the more that the experience is premised upon students' intentionality, students' agency, students' engagement, uh, the more it becomes important that they are engaged effortfully and focused and engaged agentically. Um, and that's gonna be the, the premise for optimizing the learning experiences. So hence, this third webinar seems to, it seems relevant, uh, and I hope I'm gonna make this point again, um, to focus this, this webinar on student engagement generally, but also how we engage with students who are time jealous. So just as um, backgrounding, uh, what I've said in previous um, uh, webinars is that increasingly across tertiary education, that's both vocational education and higher education, um, institutional and personal resources are being invested in providing students with workplace experiences and the key focus is on improving their readiness for the world of work and uh, uh, upon graduation and this concept of job readiness um, has emerged and also we as educators also have a concern obviously that the preparation that we provide will empower students to be able to learn across their working lives. And so the emphasis then is on integrating student experiences, um, although the practices for doing so require further elaboration and alignment with particular educational goals. And that is where work integrated education comes about. And that is the intentional process of organizing experiences to achieve particular outcomes. And that is, in this case, the integration of the two sets of experiences, workplace and the experiences provided in and through educational settings. And so a key element of work integrated education is using students' work experience to promote those outcomes. And through earlier work, what we found is that the post-practicum um, period of time um, is an optimal time to intervene, to do something educationally, because by that time, the students have had experiences, they've got something that they can actually compare, contrast and engage with others on, and others can learn from them. And so across these webinars, then we've been looking at the kind of goals that can be obtained through 
integrating these experiences, particularly through post-practicum interventions and the kind of curriculum and, post, uh, and pedagogic practices which can support that, um, those interventions post-practicum, and also this important task of engaging students in those activities. And the, the, this obviously, this webinar is a, addresses the third one of these priorities. As previously, I'll just go through these uh, precepts and um, premises that I find helpful to make sense of all of this. Firstly, that there's a key duality here, and that is learning is derived from, on the one hand, what the social world affords, what it provides, what it in, how it invites the learner to engage on the one hand. And by that way, that, by the way, that invitation can be negative. It can inhibit people's engagement. So on the one hand, um, how the social world invites um, a person to engage, and on the other hand, how the individual comes to engage with it. And just about everything I, I understand and comprehend about the educational project is premised upon the idea that we cannot just view the education provision as being something which transmits knowledge, uh, affords a, a particular experiences, provides access to particular kinds of knowledge, that ultimately it's how the learner comes to engage with what is provided for them. And much of that is premised upon how they view, construe and construct what is being provided for them. And again, this phrase I use a lot, and that is educational experiences are merely invitations to change. And ultimately, it's how learners come to engage. And while much effort is given towards um, higher education, tertiary education, developing independent learners, what we really need to be focusing on is interdependent learners, because the knowledge which students require and practitioners require it arises from the social world, you know, knowledge of nursing, medicine, dietetics, any other occupation is derived from the social world. It doesn't come from within us. And so we need to engage with it. And so we need to um, work interdependently and increasingly we engage with other workers in the workplace, we're engaged interprofessionally or even in intra-professionally we're working with others and then increasingly with technologies uh, etc which we need to engage with reciprocally and so for instance in in healthcare settings that I've um, been involved with in the last couple of years increasingly uh, workstations that have a lot of information about patients uh, are a central part of the healthcare process and so the the, the, the medical student or the nurse a healthcare practitioner needs to learn how to engage with that and learn from it and uh, interact with those artifacts. Um, and so um, the integration of experiences is um, ultimately a reconciliation. The, the, the learner comes to reconcile what they experience and that's a personal fact. And it's often based upon what the, what the person knows, can do, and values. And as I've said previously, I think it's important that we distinguish between work integrated learning, which is the personal process of learning, and work integrated education, which is the provision of experiences. And in doing that, um, you know, much of what is referred to as work integrated learning encompasses work integrated education. I just think it's very important, given um, what's happened with the concept of lifelong learning and the way that's been appropriated by global agencies and governments. And what often happens there is there isn't the separation out of understanding the difference between lifelong learning, a personal process, and lifelong education, the provision of experiences. And I just think it's important to try and avoid that error here. And as previously stated, um, there's a need for student agency and engagement to support rich and effective learning. What we know is that the generation of knowledge, um, the, the processes of learning is all about learners as me meaning makers. And that demanding kinds of knowledge, much of the knowledge which is required for uh, demanding and complex work such as um, tertiary education provides, 
um, requires engagement at a higher order level. And the work itself requires higher order activities. And these are, can only be generated through um, high levels of engagement. And as I've mentioned also, the, that ability of student, um, sorry, learner agency and engagement is essential to engage interdependently with individuals, artifacts, etc. And thanks, hang a second. Sorry about that. And there's also um, barriers that um, learners are often cautious, there's concern, there's uncertainty, there's doubt in engaging in, in work practice. And there's also this issue of time jealousy. And time jealousy is not just restricted to students, also teachers, as I've said previously, are often time jealous and you know, they'll, try, they'll decide whether work integrated education is, is worthy of their efforts, et cetera. So um, there's, there's time jealousy on the part of teachers. And as many of you are aware, um, the institutions, the workplaces that we want to engage our students in are often uh, resource jealous. And, and that is hospitals and places like that are having to make decisions about the numbers of students they engage with and how they engage with them, particularly when there's healthcare crises such as we've encountered recently. And I think it's also fair to say that higher education institutions are becoming increasingly resource jealous, given the kind of constraints on funding which have emerged not only through the recent pandemic, but reductions in funding um, generally. Okay, now um, in the three other, two other um, uh, webinars, I've, I've used this table to relate to the three concepts of curriculum the intended curriculum, what's supposed to be achieved. And this is from the handout that's available on, on the web that comes from the earlier project. And very much um, that is about the intended curriculum, you know, what's supposed to happen. Last week's session looked at the enacted curriculum, what actually happens when experiences are enacted and provided and decisions made around that. And this week, we're looking at really what is referred to as the experience curriculum, that is how students make sense, engage, engage with and learn from the experiences they've provided. And as we know from those earlier studies, there's, as you can see in this table here, students' interests and reasons for participation are central to their engagement and learning in practice settings and then reconciling it with their coursework. If they feel that this is irrelevant to their needs, um, you know, they won't engage effectively. Immediate concerns by students are likely to be their particular focus. And students um, have often, in the earlier studies, said that early and staged engagement in workplaces is uh, you know, the way forward so that they can come to know and be effective in those workplaces without being too confronted with the tasks they're given and the expectations made of them. However, one of the difficulties, of course, is that when we uh, provide experiences in workplaces for our students, in some sense, we lose control of, of what they're asked to do, what, 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 what events will occur. Um, and that's difficult. It, it can't be predicted and it can't be uh, managed externally. And what we've found though is that challenges to personal confidence and competence can be redressed through effective group processes and the sharing of experiences. And in some of the earlier webinars, I provide the examples of that. But where did this concept come from, this time jealousy? And um, I don't know, I mean, is it fair to claim a concept? Anyway, I'll have a go. I know exactly when it happened. And that is in one of the, the earlier um, national project on work integrated learning. There were 20 projects across six universities, all from the IRU group. Um, and that included um, La, La Trobe, um, Newcastle, Griffith, Flinders and Murdoch. Hope I haven't left one out there. And instances of time jealousy or being time precious emerge. And it, 
it really was quite striking. I remember in La Trobe University, what happened in their project was that they wanted to engage three kinds of students, podiatry, pediatric and prosthesis students um, in an orientation program to prepare them for effective work, work placements. Um, and this had been successfully undertaken within the physiotherapy course at La Trobe. And so what was suggested then was that these students be exposed to this and engaged in this orientation program. And so that was enacted and it was actually using the staff from the physiotherapy group to enact it. And this was a two day orientation program and it was sequenced in orientation week. However, the participants were not happy with this. The students were not happy with this. They were told they had to attend, so it was compulsory. And for them though, their perspective was, O week was about being at the beach, engaging paid part-time work, or if they were at the university, catching up with friends, et cetera, et cetera. So the very imposition of this in a space which the students thought were reserved for anything other than educational stuff came as a shock. Um, I think it's fair to say that the feedback from the two-day workshop was um, very poor. The students didn't talk about any being engaged in it. They didn't find it helpful. The only positive comments were, that I recall were really about the pizzas that were provided at lunchtime for them. Um, and there was some justification for the students' um, um, dissatisfaction. One was that, um, that most of them were in the second year and had already had some workplace experiences. And so they perhaps quite rightly asked, you know, why didn't we have this earlier? Why wasn't this a part of an, our, our earlier experience? But it was in work, because there was a fair bit of heat around this project, as you can imagine. And so I worked very carefully for the student feedback and just saw this concept that the students resented their time being taken away from other things, for an activity which they didn't find helpful. So an activity which the physiotherapy students had found helpful, according to all the feedback, um, these students just rejected. And so the rejection was on, I think, privileged time had been taken the timing of it wasn't good, the fact that they'd already had practical experiences, um, and you know, this was a poor experience. So it was during that that you know, it occurred to me that the students weren't time poor at all. They were being quite jealous about how they use their time. Also, um, I was reminded of a study which was occurring, I was working with Linda Sweet at Flinders University, uh, about midwifery students and midwifery students producing um, reflective logs on their continuity of, of care experiences. And they had to go through 20 continuity of care experiences with birthing women. And this number, as it turned out, was quite unreasonable. And the, the other thing that was apparent was how they responded to these reflective logs, which after a while just became very, very perfunctory um, and they had very limited value. But it was, again, it was understandable because these students, and many of whom I think I mentioned previously were mature age women with children, um, just simply couldn't plan their lives because they had to be there for this, for the, the birthing process for, for, for these women. And, and then I remember um, a colleague from Monash who was working at Monash then, um, Liz Malloy, um, valiantly trying to, on a Friday afternoon, um, advise her students about adult learning principles. This Friday afternoon was the Friday before the next Monday when these uh, physiotherapy students would commence their first day of their 12 week practicum. And for the first time, they'd be putting hands on real patients. They would also, for the first time, being, be evaluated in their performance by clinicians, and they were all moving into environments that they weren't particularly familiar with. And essentially they were distracted. And so I thought 
Liz was very game in doing this. And, you know, we've joked about it since that I say that the, the most game, um, game I attempted was I was once teaching the night that Kathy Freeman was running the for the gold medal at uh, at the Sydney Olympics and Kathy won I think I was alone in my classroom and all my students were obviously following Kathy Freeman quite rightly I should add anyway so so these were these first instances of this concept of of, of, of time jealousy or time preciousness but I think there's a difference between time poverty I don't have enough time and students having to make strategic decisions about how they use their time. And that came through very, very clearly, I felt, in the data from the, the Latrobe uh, uh, 3P students. Um, okay, so this project, as I've said, um, which we're referring to, was about augmenting students' learning through post-practicum educational processes. And the aim was to associate um, to promote students' learning associated with their employability through these post-practicum interventions. It comprised, as I've mentioned previously, a development conference. The first round was 14 projects from, host, from health and social care. Then we brought everybody together to share their findings from those 14 projects with the participants in the next 30 projects who learned from them and um, went and developed and enacted their projects. And, you know, across, as we've discussed in the previous two webinars, uh, there was a variety of approaches taken to secure those post-practicum outcomes. This included the use of feedback, learning circles, debriefs. And we also ran a, a student survey and the student survey, as I've mentioned, was with healthcare students. And in particular, we were concerned to identify what purposes they wanted to engage and what kind of processes did they prefer to participate in. Um, in that data, the survey, student survey, what we found was that in terms of um, the timing of the interventions that I've mentioned this data previously, is that students were quite keen for them to be fairly regularly. They wanted them after every practicum experience. Um, and that was the one that was ranked most highest above the other options there. However, um, we also got them to evaluate a, a list of, of interventions. And because we knew that some of them would be reluctant to participate, as you will see here, we had this column which said uh, WNP, which is would not participate. So we gave the students the option of indicating to us not only what was going to be um, a high preference, but also they simply wouldn't engage in. And as you'll see um, um, down the bottom there, that uh, highlighted in red, was there were um, activities which you know, a significant percentage of the students said that they would, you know, either not interested or simply would not participate in. And you can see there some of those are actually um, you know, presentations and working with peers. And they also weren't particularly interested in organizing them, as you can see. And as I mentioned in the previous session, this came as a bit of a shock to myself because I was hoping and from earlier studies that students had wanted to engage and wanted to lead these projects. Um, and here these students were saying, no, don't want to lead them. And that what their preferences were, as noted above, is that they wanted highly personalized processes that gave them feedback on their progress and how they were working at working towards um, developing the capacities to move into the into work practice upon graduation. None of which is surprising, um, but what was perhaps surprising is that their, how strongly their preferences were played out. All right, now, as I've mentioned in previously, a range of strategies were used in in the round one projects, these were oral assessment tasks, written assignments, professional exchanges, written applications and interviews, reflective writing, um, structured learning circles, debriefs, um, workshops about uh, um, students' evaluation, reflective debriefs, um, securing feedback, 
um, developing students' um, competence in feedback, et cetera, and then resume writing. And it would seem that the ones that students valued the most were those when there was some kind of engagement that um, was helpful, uh, they valued, and they gave them the opportunity to participate. Now, as mentioned previously, th th there's this difficult um, compromise. If you put something on which is compulsory, the students have to attend, the great risk is, and it's accessible, the great risk is you get back superficial responses and responses to the, the kind of criteria you've set for the students. And then if you make it voluntary, you, um, you may miss engaging with the very students who um, you most want to engage with. But what I've got are three examples here um, is um, of three instances where there were very, you know, very well structured experiences. And in the first one, despite the best efforts, the students didn't want to repeat the activity. So this was in uh, speech pathology by Libby Cardell and Andrea B. We, uh, we all call Andrea B because people like myself can't pronounce her surname. And this was a two hour workshop after the speech pathology students had completed their 12 week practicum. And they engaged the students, first of all, in this activity, it's only two hours, by the way, in a paired discussion with just one other student. And then they progressed through to larger group and whole class sharing. And the students were able to, to indicate things that they might discuss with another student, the pair discussion they didn't want to go public on. Then they went to issues they could go public on. And then this um, was then a whole class sharing. And the topics focused on professional identity, self-efficacy, and um, the integrating um, uh, clinical experiences. Um, the particular comments that the students made were all very supportive. I thought it was a good reminder, even if the info I've heard before. Uh, I need to dwell less on things that cannot be changed. Self-efficacy, you know, in the area I work, I need to work on well-being. I need to take care of myself, but you, you can always do more yourself. You need to exercise, eat practical stuff, eat a bit better. Important to have faith in yourself. So issues of you know, um, resilience being played out here. I was well placed because I was feeling overwhelmed by the recent content gave me some perspective. Yet, so there's all this positive feedback. Uh, and yet, um, when the students were, um, 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 and this is the kind of stuff they said, sorry, the workshop covered areas important to my development, you know, high percentage of them, uh, 79, more broadly applicable program was, um, uh, was was you know effective um, was well paced by the way these scores the percentage are those who reported four or five that is positive and very positive the the the, the, you know, the material was presented in an organized manner a hundred percent so that was really good yet when um, the students were asked whether um, a follow up um, or another workshop what they said is that thanks, but largely no thanks, that only 10 said that that would be uh, appropriate. So even an experience which the students reported being um, rewarding, helpful, they said that they didn't want to, to repeat it. And I think this was quite a shock to the people organizing uh, the project because they got such positive feedback from it. Now, what I wanted to do now is introduce colleague Julia Harrison um, Julia is uh, uh, an emergency physician who works at Monash in the medical school. And um, Julia was involved in um, a, one of the case, one of the projects within the study, which is on clinical peer exchange groups. And she also had another project, which wasn't part of the, um, wasn't part of the, the grant, but I think it's worth sharing with you. So what I'd like to do now is pass over to Julia to talk us through the two projects that she had and the kind of um, strategies she used and, and, and what occurred within them. So over to you, Julia.
Are you there? Julia, you're muted. You just have to unmute. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Uh, so Stephen has prepared some slides that I'm going to be speaking to. Um, I will just start by saying these two projects focused on the type of activities that were in the bottom right hand corner of the table Stephen showed just now uh, about acti activities that um, a fair proportion of students said that they wouldn't participate in. Um, but we didn't go too badly with them. Uh, so the first kind of activity uh, we called clinician peer exchange groups, uh, but it's a form of, uh, could be considered a learning circle. Um, the nature of the activity involved a room of about 30 students breaking into groups of five, uh, sitting in a circle formation and uh, taking turns in reporting back either something they'd learned in the previous couple of weeks an experience they'd had um, from placement. Uh, I'll, Stephen, I might find it easy if you just put up all the information and then I'll pick things off the slide to talk about. Uh, so, so this activity, um, it was not compulsory, but I did take attendance during the session. Um, and I did ask students if they couldn't come, if they could let me know beforehand. Um, and what the reason was, but um, they knew there were no penalties to attending. Uh, the, the elements that we included that I thought would make it um, a more uh, enjoyable or easier to engage in activity. Uh, so first of all, it was an opportunity to mix with peers and talk with peers. Uh, so these were students who were dispersed on placement in the hospital system. They were dispersed far and wide. They were usually just one or two students on a clinical unit. So for many of them, they were the only student in their immediate work environment. Um, so it was a chance for them to connect with other, other students. And I know from experience, students like uh, spending time with each other. Um, and certainly during this activity, the activity would last about half an hour. Uh, there was often a lot of laughter in the room and the volume uh, in the room was, was high. As soon as I said go, boom, the volume just shot up. They seemed to have lots to talk about. Uh, yeah, so sharing experience with peers, I think, uh, was a good thing. Um, in terms of the things that we got them to talk about, we made it fairly open-ended. Uh, so you can see here we've got a list of suggested topics. These were really triggers to help the students work out what they could contribute to the group. And you can see it's very broad. So they could talk about a case they're involved in, something someone taught them out on the, on the hospital wards, a mistake that they or someone else made, what you'd do differently next time if you had the chance. Uh, this was quite a popular topic for people to share on. Um, we called them cautionary tales. Uh, simple observations of the work done by your unit something that surprised, pleased or disappointed you, a brief summary of a common clinical problem on your unit, a description of, some, of doing something for the first time, what was it, how did it go, what did you learn, or a challenging situation. And you can see from this list that um, students could choose something that's quite factual, um, or they could choose something uh, that was, that generated an emotional response in them. So, um, uh, something that would require a bit more thinking and, and reflection. Uh, so with, with this open-ended approach, in some ways it was hard for students to think about what to talk about, but it also meant that if they had something on their mind or they'd had a really good experience, um, uh, they could talk about it. So they, they could talk about what was on their mind. I see a question, were they face-to-face -face or virtual? So they were face to face, but in 2020, they became virtual. So we, we've tried it both ways. Uh, so if you're trying to deliver a curriculum um, and cover particular topics, then you would direct the topic of discussion um, more. But we thought if we were too directive, then the students would miss out on talking about what had happened in the week or what was, what was important to them. 
the next feature was that we had the facilitator at a distance. So in this room of 30 students, there, there would be a teacher, myself, um, but I would be sitting off to the side. I wouldn't be participating in these small groups of five students sharing their experiences. So I was there to set the activity up um, and if they wanted an experienced doctor to come and talk about something, they knew that they could ask me to join their group for a bit of time. And this meant uh, that this helped students connect more with each other and um, they also felt less inhibited. Student, students are always quite keen to impress the teacher. I think they're keen to impress their peers as well, but not quite as much. They can let their guard down a bit more. So I think it would have helped the authenticity of the conversations. Someone's asked how frequent were the sessions. We were doing them every couple of weeks. Um, the next thing about these is that the discussions that people were having were very relevant to all the students' current clinical placements. They occurred in the final year of the course, which is 90% uh, placement time. Um, and these students were, their placement, they were, they were considered pre-interns. So um, they were doing very similar work to what they'd be doing as first year doctors. So the kinds of tips and experiences that they were sharing were highly relevant to them during that year, but also for the first year of work. And they, they all knew that. The other thing about it is they were all having different experiences. They were all placed in different kinds of units. Some are in the emergency department, some are in intensive care, some are in surgery, and they would rotate around placements every six weeks. But it meant that individual students had unique experiences to share, um, which I think gave them more confidence about what they had to contribute, but also helped the other students feel more interested in what they could learn from each other. And I think that contributed to engagement. Um, finally, these are undergraduate students having an educational group discussion without the presence of a teacher immediately in their conversation. Um, they still learnt a lot um, and, and this is partly because they were senior, so they're in their fifth year of the medical course. They had a, a wealth of knowledge and experience to draw on. Um, and, and to contribute in and help with um, problem solving. So, so they're just some of the elements that I think helped with the engagement. I feel like um, in, it's very easy to engage students when they're doing new things or learning new things, um, but to reflect on experience, you've got to work a bit harder because it requires slowing down um, and it often requires effortful thought. So next slide, please, Stephen. So what did the evaluation show? Uh, so looking at this table, um, so we've grouped strongly agree and agree. Um, and it was on, we had 74 students participate and we got a response rate of 100%. Um, so you can see here, most students thought the activity was enjoyable and interesting, uh, 85 and 86%, some weren't sure. Um, but it dropped down when we asked, was it worthwhile, uh, which is curious. Um, I think that gets at uh, the fact that the objectives of the session were sort of unclear. It was a bit up to them what content was covered uh, and it wasn't necessarily going to relate to any exam or assessment. Um, uh, so, yeah, so we were surprised about that. Um, having said that, uh, the vast majority said they learnt new things in the CPEG session. So this was students who had only participated in two or three sessions. Um, some found it hard to think of things to talk about. Uh, we, we sent them reminders beforehand and also during the, the week to um, try and come prepared with an item to share. Uh, even though the evaluation occurred after only two or three sessions. So it all sort of happened in a um, six week block. Uh, more than half of the students said that they were able to incorporate some of what they had learned from their peers into their own clinical practice. Um, and a majority thought that the activity should continue for future groups of students. 
And actually, um, one of my colleagues who works in another healthcare network introduced this activity for her final year students who were dispersed across three sites. And she just int introduced it at the main central site. Um, but the students at the other site complained and asked, could they do it too? So I figure that was some, some good feedback. Um, so we, we've done a fairly extensive evaluation, which has been published in one of the um, chapters of the books that have uh, come from this project. Um, but the main benefits, according to the students, uh, were to do with learning, um, connection with peers and feeling supported by peers. And I'll just let you read through some of the quotes here. I'll be quiet for a minute so you can read those. Um, also, Julia, um, there are some questions in the chat as well. Okay, so I'll be guarded by you and Stephen about when to answer questions. Okay. Um, Please feel free. Please feel free. Okay, okay. If, if you're interested in finding out more about the activity, I've got a um, how-to guide for CPEGs. Uh, I think it's relevant for any health professional kind of group. Um, it's been tried with nursing students um, at a postgrad and undergraduate level and also physio students. Uh, but I think it's, it would also work for other um, disciplines and, and areas of employment. Um, wh wherever senior students are um, doing workplace-based experiences, it could work. If you, if you Google my name, Julia Harrison and ResearchGate, you'll be able to download a copy of that, or I can give it to Stephen to distribute. Yes, please send it through and I will attach it to the website. Yeah. Um, okay, so some questions. How frequent were the sessions? So when we did this you study... Are, you answered that. Julia, do you want me to yeah. ask them um, with my voice? Sure. <laughs> so this is... Sure. I'm Meg Phelps. I'm from the University. I'm the, from the University of Sydney um, Children's Hospital Westmead Clinical School. So oh, you'd, right. you responded about how frequent were the ses sessions. I just wondered what the, um, the students called the, the sessions. You, I think it sounds as if you, um, when communicating about them, called them CPEGs. Did the, st the students likewise call them CPEGs or did they have another name? Sometimes that can be quite revealing as to what they oh, see the right. goal um, or the activity yeah. being. That's interesting. So when we ran this project, initially we called them learning circles, um, but I didn't really like the name and I didn't use the, the word learning circles much, um, but it was in the first evaluation. Uh, so, so we came up with, with a more appealing name, um, CPEGS, and I chose a name that would appeal to students or um, clinicians in practice. And actually the impetus for the, um, the nature of this activity was thinking about, well, how do senior doctors like to learn? And we often just discuss with our peers, experiences, challenges, interesting cases. Um, we do it formally and informally. Uh, so I thought we'll, we'll set up a formal session of this nature for the students and see how it goes. And then my other question is- They, they do use the word CPEGS, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Hello, Stephen. That's an interesting view. Okay, that's better. Um, uh, and the other question was about any, um, I guess, more sensitive issues or um, things that might require some follow up where the students were reporting to each other and maybe to the group um, issues like, I guess, classically bullying and harassment, but also the poor performance of seniors or breaches of protocol procedure, those sorts of issues. Did you have a, um, a pathway suggested to them if they had wanted to talk further about any of those things? Um, yeah, so that was one of the roles of the facilitator, so the senior clinician in the room. Uh, the there have, I'm trying to think, I can't recall any situations um, that have needed follow up beyond what we could do in the session. I haven't needed to do any one on one follow up. Uh, I have in the activity to follow. Um, but yeah, we make sure the students know that if they want to talk further one on one with the facilitator, they can, um, or if the group wants to bring the facilitator in to help resolve some questions, um, uh, the facilitators there, but yeah, that, it didn't really, um, 
there, were, there weren't any instances where I thought, oh, gee, we have to act, um, go further. Uh, but I can see that it could happen easily. Thank you. Okay, shall we move to the next activity? Um, so this is um, an activity called ORADA, so online reflective discussion activities to enhance clinical learning. Uh, this is an activity um, that we do for our final year medical students. There's 500 of them. Um, they're dispersed across two countries and all over the state of Victoria. Um, and I wanted to get these students reading and thinking about uh, some issues uh, that aren't traditionally covered in a medical course. Um, and uh, we came up with this activity, Orada. We've been running it since 2006. Um, and it sits in a subject called patient safety and preparation for practice. Uh, and um, it involves students, th there's seven topics. It involves students reading or watching a video in relation to one of the topics. I'll give you an example of the types of topics. Um, so one is the learning curve, uh, handover, so handovering, handing over care of a patient, correct patient identification, when things go wrong in patient care, humility in healthcare, uh, diagnostic error, equipment design and human factors, and patient safety culture. So um, it's kind of a mix of uh, practical and um, uh, more, I guess, esoteric topics. Um, the, this is an activity where students have to participate. So it's a hurdle requirement. Uh, so they're forced to do it. Um, I encourage their participation or their engagement, because you can do it without engaging, uh, by telling them that uh, this is to help develop their wisdom. Uh, so their wisdom for the workplace. Um, I tell them it's challenging. Uh, I tell them to set plenty of time aside for the reading uh, and um, I guess kind of excite them about the prospect of uh, some intellectual work. Um, uh, and hope that they will engage. Uh, so, so with each topic, they have some readings. The readings, we try and make them as interesting as possible. They might be journal articles. They might be excerpts from autobiographies written by healthcare workers um, or uh, things written by patients. Could be a TED talk. We've got an article from the conversation. Um, might be an interview with someone. So it's a, a variety of different um, uh, artifacts. And then they need to think about the artifact in relation to their, and the topic in relation to their own experiences in the workplace. And also thinking about in relation to that topic, how might what they've seen and thought about and read about influence their own practice. Um, and uh, that's what we get them to post on, on a forum, in a group with uh, fellow students. And they need to put their own post up and comment on another student's post. So they know that other people will be reading their work. Um, so here are some questions. These are just some, an example of uh, the type of questions we might ask. These are questions taken from the diagnostic error topic. Uh, so next slide, please, Stephen. So one of the challenges with this activity is that we ask them about their enthusiasm for um, online learning activities. Uh, so I approached these activities with a degree of enthusiasm. Um, they didn't at all. So less than a third of students were feeling optimistic that the activity would be good uh, just because of the nature of it, an online activity. I do not enjoy these online activities. I, I did not enjoy the activity. So um, nearly half said they didn't enjoy it. Uh, and a big chunk weren't sure. So it's not looking great. Um, these online activities were worthwhile. So a, a few more thought that they were worthwhile and a lot weren't sure. Um, the readings were interesting. So 
61% either agreed or strongly agreed that the readings were interesting. And there were quite a few strongly agrees in there. Um, so perhaps the readings were okay. Only 9% didn't like them. Uh, they didn't seem to mind about other students reading their reflections. They thought the topics were relevant on the whole. So that's good. The activity helped me to understand some of my experiences and observations on the ward. Uh, so it did shed some light on things for about half of the students, which is quite good considering many of them um, weren't, weren't uh, looking to uh, or weren't expecting to get much from the activity. Uh, about half thought the activity would make them a better doctor. I've put some of what I've learned from this activity into practice. So a third have. Uh, this activity should continue for future students. So even though, um, even though only 27% of students uh, enjoyed the activity, 44% um, that it thought it should continue for future students. And this activity helped shape some of my attitudes about patient care. So um, more than half uh, said that it did. Um, so I think you can, if you can find an online activity that's cheap and can reach uh, such a large number of dispersed students that actually they think might help shape their attitude to patient care, uh, that's probably pretty good. Um, I'll just get you to read this last quote. We dug down a bit deeper onto this idea that um, the activity helped shape attitudes about patient care, which part of the activity had the most impact. And um, in order, it was the readings that had the most impact by far. And then thinking about the questions that were asked came next. And then writing the actual post came next. And finally, commenting on a fellow students and reading other students' posts came last. This was the student's perspective of, um, of what influenced their, um, their learning the most. Uh, a few students asked, can't we just do the readings and not have to post? Um, the problem with that is if, if we said just read these things, we'd have no way of making them do it or knowing if they've done it. Um, so I think there's learning value in uh, committing to words in the post and there's also learning value in reading what other students have written. Um, so with a lot of the education that I'm involved in providing, I'm used to much, much better, uh, re re much, much better evaluations for the value of the teaching. So things like immersive simulation and um, lectures and um, workshops and things, you know, I'm used to uh, 95 or more percent of people being happy. So, so this is quite low, um, but factoring in that it's getting students to read stuff that they wouldn't normally read and think about, um, it costs almost nothing to um, run. We, we have a fairly, um, uh, it's really just the person who is moderating, but the, the moderator is generally fairly hands-off. I guess it's a cost thing. Um, uh, and it does seem to have some impact. Um, so I might, I might leave it at that. Uh, that. That's it for slides for me, is that right? Yes, Julia, yeah. thanks for that. Yeah. Um, and just uh, thanks very much for, for that, Julia, for providing those, those examples. Uh, just a couple of points is that um, um, certainly medical students uh, appear to be very time jealous, so engaging them in this, these kind of tasks seems to be important. And the other thing I think that's noteworthy about Julia's work is what she's setting up there is some professional practices, some professional habits, which while they're pertaining to the initial preparation of these doctors will be the kinds of practices they'll need to exercise throughout their working life to continue to develop their skills. By the way, if you look at uh, Julia's website, you'll see a very, very beautiful rhyme that she's written to her graduating students. And uh, so check the web website out and just look at the, the rhyme that she wrote, which is absolutely delightful. Okay, I'm just gonna finish up the presentation. Hopefully we'll have some time for discussion is that 
by repeating stuff I've mentioned before that um, the importance of these, edu these education interventions is underpinned by um, understanding a learner expectations and getting them to engage and finding them worthwhile. The readiness for students to engage that they actually have the capacities, the understandings to effectively engage in practicums, but also the post practicum activities. And when students are time precious, we, we, you know, we, we need to understand this and we need to find ways of engaging them. It's a fact, it's, it's something that we can't just simply wish away, it exists. And that um, many of the interventions have to be compulsory for the kind of reasons that Julia said, if it's associated with designated parts of, parts of the course that need to be assessed. Um, but there's this issue, this balance then between having voluntary participation and um, having things which are compulsory and when they're voluntary and can be focused on the student's interest, you're likely to get uh, be perhaps better engagement than when perhaps things are um, uh, compulsory and the students don't want to do them. Um, having the, a, a safe environment for students to share seems important, and I think that's evident. Um, and, and then finding ways that align, balance the needs of students with the, with the requirements of the course seems to be important. And the, 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 the chapter that Julia referred to uh, comes from this book, which is uh, an edited volume, which was out in 2019, I think. Okay, in some, so we need to position work integrated education within current discussions about education being responsive to emerging work requirements and, and student needs. And um, we have to justify and make invitational requests for students to engage effectively. When students are making strategic decisions about how they spend their time, it reminds us that rather than just expecting students to see the same worth and value in the, in the content that we teach. We also have an obligation to actually explain to students why this, why this is important. And I think Julia provided some good examples of that. Um, and assist um, students identify the kind of occupational destinations they want to secure and how, what is being prepared for them, what, what's being provided for them can assist in that process try and provide and manage experiences in workplace, albeit through activities where we don't actually engage, but we draw upon their experiences and trying to find ways of then engaging students in effortful and focused ways. And again, uh, acknowledging that students are a time jealous and that um, adaptability, the ability to adapt the knowledge they use and that's sort of applying it in the first instance in, in the practice setting is likely to arise from effortful learning, um, I suspect. So in this way, work integrated education can achieve these types of goals. So the discussion, which will break into groups, but we'll have a Q&A first, um, is about you know, the following. How can you provide the kind of experiences students prefer and will engage in yet meet the requirements of the course? Which kind of strategies presented and discussed would be appropriate and helpful for your students and programs? And what are the key principles that we should take away from this and apply as teachers in higher education? But what I'll do is I'll just stop sharing now and hopefully there's some questions um, from myself or hopefully from for Julia that we can um, uh, discuss. So are there any further questions? Any in the chat that hasn't been addressed? Um, I think um, Carol Joy had one from at the top. She liked the concept of the reconciliation. Have you written about that somewhere? Sort of like yeah, the first question right up the top of the chat. Right, okay. Sorry, I can't see them, so I'll just have to- Oh, that's all right. Maybe, yeah. um, Carol, Joy, did you want to ask the question now? You can unmute yourself. Okay, unmuted. No, just a couple of comments that when Stephen gets the questions, he can 
let me know. I'm interested in where I can read more about the, what did I say? Um, the two things, the, the concept of reconciliation. I All right, yeah, really okay. And if you've so, written about yeah, that. So the idea is that sort of integration almost refers to having two sets of experiences and how we bring them together. Um, and we, you know, the, the kind mm. of arrangements mm. we're talking mm. about here when we have a deliberate post-practicum intervention and the key focus there is to try and bring together the experiences in the two settings. But ultimately, um, you know, learning being a personal process, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a personal fact that it's how the person comes to reconcile what they experience themselves um, based upon what they know can do and value. And you saw that in the responses to the, these three case studies that presented. Some people highly valued them and others didn't. So there's gonna be a, a diversity of responses based upon people's um, backgrounds, people's experience, people's preferences and, and, and what they see as being um, uh, appropriate. So the, the reconciliation thing is there's how humans come to um, construct knowledge from what they experience, which is often a process of reconciling what they experience with, with what they know. And, and we've seen a crack of an example in what's playing out in America at the moment, where there appears to be um, an astonishing number of people who are absolutely convinced from the worldview that this election has been fraudulent against all the evidence being provided and by the diverse sources. So that, you know, trying to re-reconcile those folk to the fact that, you know, as we understand, this is a legitimate election. It's that reconciliation process. So you can provide the information, you can, you know, have authoritative source say, say, saying this is gonna be the case, but there'll still be um, different ways that people will reconcile that. And we'll find the same thing, I'm sure, as we move into the, um, the use of vaccines um, once they're broadly available. Mm -hmm. People will be told that they're totally safe, uh, uh, et cetera, but there'll be groups that who will who will simply say, no, no, this is this is a plot, this is this is not good, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, and refer to earlier experiences. So that's that personal process of reconciliation, which, you know, and this is why we need to think about the concepts of the experience curriculum because we can only provide experience, we only provide justifications, but we have to, the more we can do of that and the more we can uh, try and justify the approaches we take, hopefully the reconciliations will be um, you know, positive and productive. Does that help? Yeah, I think it's a really, especially in a post-practicum context, and I can't yeah. um, help but then think about how reconciliation can come after, but if you want that reconciliation to be powerful, you're yeah. planning for it before, during, et cetera. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. it's not the end of the experience because, and someone else made a comment to um, Julia in the chat about, um, do you ask the students even later when they reflect whether there might've been what I would term some reconciliations later when they're actually practicing. So I just, I like the word reconciliation because it, it's, it makes you think about certain things. Yes, yes. And it's that whole process of justifying um, mm. experiences. For instance, I suspect that if you do, and I, I've did a, I don't mentioned, I've done a big study in Singapore on the use of continuing education and training. And the strong preference was face-to-face -face interactions. That data was gathered before the mm. pandemic. And since in the last nine months, you know, people have just got used to using this type of media. And I just wonder now if I was to run the survey again, and we're gonna try and do that by the way, mm. to see whether there's a different result now, simply because people are, are no, very, become very familiar with this. So the reconciliation of the experience now is, I suspect is gonna be far more uh, productive. And it'd be interesting, as you say, to go back to speak to Julia, Julia students in some time and for them to realize um, some of the, um, uh, the, the worth of some of the experiences which they probably didn't value uh, as much at the time they were offered. You're very interesting. And the reason I say that, and that's probably interesting for, for Megan, is that um, 
um, I was involved in a study looking at what's called FY1 and FY2 doctors in the United in Scotland. And um, the despite the last year of the um, two years, I beg your pardon, two years of the medical students experience um, being in clinical settings, when they started being a doctor on day one, it was only then when they're actually making the decisions, they suddenly realized deficits in their knowledge. So that, you know, when they're in the driver's seat, so to speak. So the, the kind of reconciliations they had at that mm -hmm. time, they realized there was stuff they should have paid greater attention to, um, perhaps in the first year of their courses in, in basic science and stuff. I hope that helps. So I guess the kids the point I'm trying to make is the integration of experience is one thing, trying to organize those experiences as per this exercise, but ultimately it's how the learners come to reconcile their experiences and make sense of them. That's the distinction, I think. Any more questions? I, I thought there were some two new messages um, came in. Let me just go to those. Um, yeah. I don't yeah, I don't think there's any more questions. Okay, what I suggest we do now is we go into those groups, two groups perhaps, our numbers are getting small. Um, do you think we should go into one group or two groups? We can do two groups and um, four people in one and five in the other, or we can do okay. one big group. Um, I suggest you go into one big group and then okay. if you can address those questions for, and then talk about those questions and then come back, that would be helpful, I think, yeah. All right, we'll do that now. Thanks, Samia. Okay, I think everybody's back. Um, would you like to share with us what you've been discussing and addressing this issue? You, would you like to say something? Sorry to point. <laughs> You? I was picking on you. You need to unmute. Yep, there we go. I, I missed. That's a rare event. Um, yeah, so we we uh, tried to distill principles out of out of what's come up, um, and I didn't take any notes on it. I just have what's in my head. Um, so, ladies, if anyone wants to help me out here, um, I think. Oh, Ah, yes, okay. Um, so yeah, we looked at, at the need to manage expectations and scaffold and then refer back uh, in the reflection, in, in the post, post practicum things and make sure that that is well set up at the top. Um, I, I talked an awful lot about synchronicity and, and the power um, from the first example given, the first case study of having students actually talking to each other as opposed to maybe asynchronously deciding whether or not I feel like reading a whole bunch of posts and responding. Um, and my gut feeling, which I don't know if the other ladies agreed with, but uh, my gut feeling is that, that synchronous exchange is far more powerful if it can be managed, even if it's via Zoom rather than face-to-face. -face. Um, that seems to work better. Um, Abigail, anything to add? Yeah, we were also talking about having whole, whole of curriculum view. So threading mm. things through right from the beginning to the end. So to try and help students understand the purpose and what they're leading to in terms of their jobs, um, you know, employability skills and how, so that then they're more likely to engage because they see how that's building up to what they want to do post work, uh, post uh, uni. Mm. It was interesting, by the way, in the 
particularly in the first phase projects, how the concept of employability was interpreted by the, um, by the, the projects. Some saw it, as you'd have seen, in terms of preparing for that first job. So a focus on, you know, mock interviews and um, sorting out CVs. So there's quite different as well. And then others were obviously, as you notice, were far more concerned about clinical competence and being able to, to practice effectively. Um, so there are quite different views. And I think both are important, by the way, um, but there are quite different uh, perspectives on what constitutes employability and where the ethics should be directed. For instance, I think there was the, um, it was in physiotherapy, there's a lot of emphasis on preparation for interviews and stuff because I think it's a fairly competitive job market. There's relatively few jobs within you know, hospitals and a lot of physiotherapists ended up ending up working as sole traders, you know, like small business persons. So I think there, there was a particular set of concerns about that pathway for, for graduates. Yeah. Other principles that um, you perhaps discerned? I think that crystallized it, didn't it, Hugh? <laughs> could, could I ask yes. a question? Oh yeah, by all means. Um, I'm just curious, so for the participants, what sort of, uh, what courses are you teaching? Um, so I'm, I guess I'm interested in uh, whether the time jealous issue is the same uh, across courses. Uh, speech pathology. Um, I think I think students are very very busy, and so you've got to give them. You know, if you're making them come in, it's got to be they got to see the point and really uh, see how it is going to help them to get through their placements. But I think I've found in speech pathology that getting them to placement preparation and uh, things that it's easier perhaps than lectures because they really know that they've got to pass their, well, I mean, they have to pass their lectures too, but it seems to me that hands-on thing really triggers anxiety that they want to be sure they're really well prepared for. Mm. So you can really make the most of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was in creative industries and 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 I agree. I, I think um, there was a comment in the second case study from a student who talked about, I left it all to the last minute. And I think <laughs> it's always a temptation with students to do exactly that because they, you know, rather particularly early in the in the semester, they would rather go drinking with their buddies and or play footy and or whatever it is that they do rather than crack open the book and, and start thinking. And as a matter of professional practice, encouraging them to on, you know, diarise regularly and take good reflective notes on, on practice and so on is just such an invaluable practice to try and, you know, break their little heads into thinking about early on. Um, so I absolutely love the idea of the regular ones. Uh, the, you know, the fortnightly catch-ups, um, but I don't know that that's practical because as, as we were talking about, sometimes in the creative industries, a student will get, you know, one day a week for 10 weeks and sometimes they'll get two weeks of an intense festival preparation. So fortnightly meetings is not always helpful, but I think if they're given the opportunity, students will absolutely leave things to the last second. Um, partly because, you know, if you show up to an online discussion forum, you can read 10 posts in an hour and then respond as opposed to having to read 10 each one a week. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of sunk time cost, if I can use that term, in that kind of participation as opposed to showing up for a, a, an online chat for an hour and bang. Mm -hmm. uh, Olivia's comment. I'm oh, sorry, you go, go ahead, Beth. Go I was ahead. going to say quickly. Um, I'm also creative industries and one of the things I was talking about was that expectation that students have. So when they sign up for a, a teaching course, medical health kind of course, they expect that they will do a work experience of some sort, but for creative industries they often don't. And I think one of the principles for me now is that real um, setting the purpose and the expectation really early that this is also a form of compulsory education for them not opt in in year three as mm. he was just saying 
Mm. Yes, I mean, and, and there's quite different um, <clears throat> agendas here, isn't there? I mean, I, uh, Beth and Hugh are working in the creative industries where um, you know, the kind of work there is very project-based as against to some people working in highly regulated sectors where patient care or student needs are a priority. So there are quite different um, agendas um, playing out. Um, and Olivia was just, and I could come back to that, but I'll just, Olivia was saying that, um, that from speech, sorry, occupational therapy, like Abigail, there's a, a lot of concern about placement preparation and performance. So the students are actually very much focused on what they'll be doing next week. Um, and that's a sort of preoccupation. I mean, can we use that in a more, um, uh, I'm mean, oh, sorry, I'll rephrase the question. Is it, are, are we using that in the most effective ways or can there be other ways that we can use all of that energy and focus to um, get students to, um, uh, um, direct their thinking towards the, the process. Sorry, Stephen, your sound, we can hear you, but it's almost making like... Oh, static. Do you want a static type of um, sound? Maybe if you could try muting and unmuting, maybe it might go back. Yeah. Is that better? No. no. Does it help if we're all muted or not? I doubt it. I think it's probably a local in, interconnection. I'm, I'm getting no indication the signal is anything but good. I'm sorry. Um, um, a Borg. <laughs> uh, sorry about Joe, what, what to do. Um, can you continue the conversation? Stephen, you could try um, just for a quick, just leaving and coming back, maybe. Could, could someone rephrase Stephen's last question, sorry, perhaps, and then we can talk. I can't. Sorry. Maybe you can try saying it one more time. Oh, is he gone? Yeah, he's just okay. yeah. back in. He might have gone. Should be back in a moment. I'm gonna have to go. Sorry. See you guys. That's okay. Oh, it's nearly time anyway. Yeah. Um, everything he'll send through is um, we'll email it out to you all the slides and any notes or anything like that and all the links to the website if you need to leave. But I think he's joining back. He's back now. Thanks, Abigail. Thanks. Sorry, oh. I have to go as well, but it's been really interesting and thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Okay, I'll leave the the camera off. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Oh, that's yeah. good. I'll leave the camera off in case that's um, asking. I, I guess I would, the, one of the observations I was just making is that um, and I, I, um, the difference between the kind of fields that Hugh and um, Mary, was it, sorry, um, are operating in and the... Um, uh, more regulated areas where there's particular requirements that need to be met um, and the way that we could use students' energies and concerns about the practicums that were arising in a more productive and positive way. It was just a, an observation. And I think we, I think we all understand that some, when somebody's first going to go in and engage with patients, et cetera, or students as a teacher, whatever, that's going to be potentially quite stressful. You haven't done it before. Um, and is that, is that something that we can focus students' efforts on? Mm. Yeah, um, look, my experience in that is coming from the creative industries is that students who think that they can just get a degree and go and knock on a door of a big building and get a job are deluded. And one of the things that I loved about the ASEN paper in the International Will research paper was the sheer diversity of things that constitute work integrated learning 
that are not just service learning. Um, and my philosophy has been for a long time that the very first day you're standing in front of a student, you should talk to them about getting experience in some form or another, whether mm. it's a formal industry placement or whether it's a, hey, on the weekend, go volunteer with these guys or, or even transferable skills. So an awful lot of students in the creative industries work in Maccas. And that still gets you, even though it's not discipline specific, it still gets those students great communication skills, great customer management skills, and various other things that matter in a workplace. So I, I try really hard to talk to them about whatever experiences they are having. You know, I, when I was 18, I was in the fortunate position that my parents could pay for board at college and therefore I didn't have to have a job and I could concentrate full time on study. But I don't know any students recently that are in that boat. So whatever work experiences they are having, leverage that. You know, yes, it's not clinical practice supervising and diagnosing patients, but it's still communication. It's still teamwork. It's still those generic skills. Yes. And um, having knowledge of the field, so you have some realistic understandings um, of relevance to Olivia um, is that one of my PhD students is um, looking at issues of engagement of physiotherapy students and the, the high level of um, the high level of dropout from the field after graduation. And one thing that we've noticed is many of the people that come into the phys physiotherapy area come in with particular expectations because they have been an athlete at school or a sports person at school. And along the way, they've had an injury which has brought them into contact with a physiotherapist. And so they have one particular view of what physiotherapy work um, is entailed. So that can be, on the one hand, um, a, 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 an informed engagement, but it also might misrepresent uh, the field. Hence, a lot of the studies I've read are talking about the importance of and my own work, about the importance of getting students to experience um, the field that they intend to participate in as early as possible. So they have some sense of that field um, and can inform themselves about it. Now, I'm sure I've mentioned this previously, but currently we have over 50% of apprentices in Australia drop out before completion. And that's largely the males. And that is that they often make choices about occupations based on gender. Um, same with nursing, I think, and same with uh, hairdressing apprentices, which are almost universally female, um, making choices that are not informed. So anything we can do to inform our, our students about the realities of, of, of practice through engaging in, in, in work situations seems to be important. All right, I, I think we're close to time and thank you very much for persisting through technical problems and um, hanging in. I'll just see if the, the camera will work now. Um, sorry, Stephen, can I just add one thing to that? Please, to, please. Uh, just occurred to me, um, a further example of what you were just talking about the, from my own experience, which leads to the, the point of this is perhaps scaffolding the experience in terms of alternatives so I had a friend back in school, she's a year older than me in high school, who suffered glandular fever in, in senior, but still got a 990 TE score and desperately wanted to be a doctor. So she studied medicine and absolutely killed it in her MBBS, which was fine. But then in her one year post MBBS of practicum, she quit after nine months. And I went, hell, Caitlin, you're three months from realizing your dream, why are you quitting? And she said that her practicum position had been in casualty at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. And the way she expressed it to me was, if I have to stick my finger up one more patient's backside, I'm going to go nuts. So what she did then, of course, a clever girl that she is, she went and studied medical ethics and she's now an ethicist in Washington and you know, her career has been unimpaired. But I wonder whether there's scope in these will things to consider those alternatives. We, just because you've done an MBBS doesn't mean you have to be a doctor, a GP, a surgeon or whatever it is. There are all these other things around our industries that may or may not be appropriate. So that was yeah. just a thought that I that occurred to me when you were speaking. Yes, and, and you should share those thoughts with the um, um, Federal Minister of Education, who seems to think that the only pathway is 18 year olds deciding what occupation they want, and that will be where they'll end up. So, um, yes, so um, yeah, that's a, I mean, because the pathways that 
people take are, are very diverse. It's interesting though, because I, I, I think I mentioned previously that one of the other pro earlier projects about creative industries, the, the students would had to develop a portfolio which got them to look at the various options there would be for their work in the creative industries to give them a sense of scope of it. Um, and I think that was an interesting exercise, but my, um, not really my brother-in-law because he's not married, but my very close friend is a, a painterly artist called Stephen Notling and who's exhibited wi widely um, in Brisbane, is quite well known, scrapes a living though, but he was invited to come and talk to fine art students at QUT about what it meant to be a practicing artist. And he tried to talk to them about the realities of the work, that you actually have to have an income to buy paint and canvases, et cetera. And he makes his own frames. And what he was saying was he found disappointing is that many of the students just didn't want to know um, that they were rejecting of the reality of what it meant to be um, an artist. So um, again, it's this whole thing where you can provide the experience, but again, um, you can't always guarantee that uh, students will want to hear what you're saying and, and want to engage mm. with it. So it's that, it's that complex process of providing the opportunity for them to consider it and making that as plausible as possible, but there's no guarantees uh, in, in this game. And I mean, your, your friend could have had quite a different set of experiences where she mm. wasn't doing that work. Um, <laughs> But what I've heard is countless stories of young women becoming nurses and, and the, you know, because they think they'll be helping sick people, which is what they do. But the reality of helping sick people is often just not how they viewed nursing mm. work. And then they leave in large numbers as well. Mm. Similarly, teachers who can't handle government administration and bureaucracy. Um, the, the other one that I would come back to in the creative industry, Stephen, and I don't know how you can prepare this through a will program, is so many people in the creative industries are self-employed sole traders. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and there is no big institution that you can go to and learn how to be, you know. And the, the thing that has sprung up around that is this sort of mini sub-industry of training of varying quality that fills that gap. You know, there's, there's the entire body of grey literature of how-tos, you know, how to write a good song, how to publish your music, how to... And some of that is absolutely terrible. <laughs> and a lot of it is very expensive and pointless. But that was the starting point for my PhD, was looking at how do, how do businesses start up like that and what, what do people need to know? So I don't know how we can address that in a will context, but I try really hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the way, the issue we're dealing with here is, is, is not restricted to what we're doing. I mean, you talk to school teachers mm. and my wife used to teach in a very tough school in south of Brisbane. And many of the students were from a Pacifica community that didn't engage and didn't necessarily value schooling. Mm. And, and she often said, I, I, if I just wish the students would give as much attention to their maths and English classes as they do to singing you know, which is something culturally they value. Um, and that was great, she says, but you know, if only they gave the same amount of effort directed towards, you know, their, the other subjects, which will be you know, important for them in the future, that, that would be great. So it's how can we engage students? The issue we're dealing with here is, 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 not, restricted to, um, is not restricted to this particular project. Yeah, there's a certain thing students don't know that they need to know, and they're often resistant, particularly in creative industries. Like trying to get creative people to do accounting is just a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. And this is the experience that Stephen had when he spoke, spoke yeah. to the students and just saying, it's a business. And if nothing else, um, yes, you can live in the garret, um, but you actually need money to buy paint and canvas and that sort of stuff. And yeah, so. Um, or, the, or the great tradition of the patron. Well, yes, there's always that, but <laughs> they. Um... Do you know some, Megan? I'm looking for one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, thank you very much for participating in this session. And um, some of you have been in all three. That shows great resilience on your part. And I hope it's been useful for you. And the material will be there up on the web for however long. And should you wish to direct others to it, please feel free. So thanks very much for your contribution. I'd also like to thank um, uh, uh, Louise and Samia for their support in 
putting these sessions on each week. That's been very helpful. So thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. All the best. Thank Look after we'll email everything out to everyone. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.